This conference will now be recorded. I'm assuming Rick will be joining us. Uh, yes, he's he's in the conference room with Brian Naples and I. He's they're here. Uh, we're, yeah. just, yeah. we're, just, we're just maintaining uh, social distance. <laughs> I've got you guys on the big projector screen so they can watch, but you guys, okay. you guys can only see my my face. <laughs> That's what you call it with that blue thing, huh? All right. Well, it is six thirty. Uh, we might as well uh, see about calling a meeting to order. With the idea of the first order of business being the Pledge of Allegiance, if you would please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Okay, next order of business then would be um, consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Patrick Bernie, so moved. Is there a second? Second, Joel. Okay, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Aye, stands voted unanimously. Since there are no items removed from the consent agenda, we'll move on to item number four, discussion and action, approval of the director's report. Is there a motion to approve, sign? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, gentlemen, any questions, any comments uh, with respect to the director's report? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm jumping ahead uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. On, on page 4.3. Uh, there's a reference to the water main replacement contract 37 materials. Uh, yeah. Bill, I wonder if you just give me a quick, um, just a quick summary of uh, contract 37 materials. And and it's really you know, more of a curiosity question. I, I just I just didn't know what that was. Excuse me, Joel. Yes, Joel Rick here. That was my paraphrasing and summarizing what Neil had said in his reports about the design specifications, plans, bid documents, those sorts of things. Did you hear me? No, maybe you could just repeat that, that Rick. And, and I, like I, uh, th those are my words. And when I set, used the, the phrase materials, I meant I was referring to Neil's more detailed comments in his monthly report where he talks about design specs and bid documents and drawings and such. All right, so it's really a collection of all the, uh, all, the all those materials. Yes. I'm fine, thanks, thank you, Rick. Good. Okay, uh, uh, is there anything else, sir? Patrick? Yeah, yes, if, uh, if Joel's done, I didn't want to jump in. Okay. Patrick, all yours. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, just if uh, looking at the Tony's aspect of the uh, director's report, just bringing us up to speed on how we look in in terms of the retail cost of service study, where we are, are we looking on, we, are we still expecting to have the draft of the revised weights by February 28th, 2021? So if you give us an update on that. Sure. Yeah. Um, Brian and I have been meeting with the rate consultant and uh, based on our last uh, meeting with him, uh, he feels pretty confident that we'll have it by that by that date. and We'll be able to share that with uh, the PUC. And um, what are, I know, Rick, I know you talked about this a couple of months ago. When are we expecting to have our workshops on the rates? On this, well, on the study. If this schedule holds, it would be sometime in March. Right. We'll, we'll wait to see what the product looks like, how comfortable staff is with it, 
and and then check with your gentlemen's availabilities and schedules and go from there. Okay, great. Uh, I had another question. Um, it's it's drawn from the uh, the wholesale power summary, but it's something that we've talked about. But we haven't talked about in a couple of months. I note that we lost close to seventy thousand dollars associated with Pierce in December. Um, just can, can you remind me where we are on a, our analysis um, on exiting Pierce exiting the Pierce project? Yes, uh, your question's timely. I've just recently received an updated analysis of the project from Craig Keeney. And I haven't had a chance to review it and synthesize it and get it out to you gentlemen yet, but I do want to put this on a meeting agenda within the next meeting or two and have, have us review it with in some detail and, and, and discuss it. Uh, a reminder to everybody that um, we can, we're in the last year of the agreement and we can exit the agreement with, with no action on our parts. We did discuss that some time ago. I, I can't cite the exact meeting, but we did discuss that. Uh, that's both my and, and the law department's reading of, of the agreement. Um, if we wanted to stay, we need we would need to provide a a 12 month notice we're inside 12 months of the ending of the agreement and uh that would then allow for a five-year extension so th those are the terms of the agreement right okay um great the only the only thing i wanted to add to that is just that i don't, if you do put this on a, the agenda this may be something that we could talk about in an executive session because of the yes, sensitivity of the commercial nature. I'm exploring, excuse me, I'm sorry, Mr. Bernie. Uh, I'm exploring that with the law department and they haven't been encouraging, uh, but in, in having the proper justification be able to do that. But uh, I, I have, what I'm going to do is prepare, in essence, all the material that I'd want to present to you gentlemen and present that to the law department and say, this is what this is. I think it ought to be an executive session for this, that, or the other reason, and then see what they have to say. And that's in essence what they've asked me for. Okay, great. I agree that's the preferred way to do it. And then the yeah, we went through our last meeting and detailed, I went through the, the director's report for purposes of, of walking through on um, em employment issues. N not going to do that, but probably going to revisit that um, at, during one of our two March meetings. So just giving the general managers a heads up on that. Thank you, Patrick. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, the only comment I have is um, with regard to page 4-21, four, four this is with respect to wholesale power marketing developments. Um, and what I want to mention there is on the, the second item, which is concerning uh, addressing uh, internal mar market monitor con you know, concerns with regard to behind the meter uh, generation. Um, this looks, what, what they are talking about here is with, the, with regard to uh, currently today, as far as ISO is concerned, it would appear that uh, load reduction from this is not appropriate. The generators, in fact, have come through with an idea that if it's five megawatts or less, that it would be that it would be fine. I mention this only because of the fact that our previous involvement in 50 and five, um, and it looks like this is this would cover uh, the people at CMEC in terms of what they're doing, and it would co cover it on a retroactive basis if in fact they it gets approved in this manner so that is uh that to me is very good news for you know potentially for us and and also for CMEC. and that's really the only comment that i have uh you know at this point and if there's nothing else i will call for a vote on the director's report all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye 
I saw the mouth move there, Joel. Okay. All right. Next order of business. Um, well, I'm going to take a look at this. Uh, public Q and A was scheduled for 6:40, and guess what? We're right at 6:40. So, are there any questions from the public? Yes, please. All right. Uh, if you would give your name and your address, please, ma'am. Sure. Adelaide Kopfer, 35 Wiffle Tree Road in Wallingford. Um, I have two questions tonight again. One, is there an update yet on the EV charging data pilot and maybe also on the position um, of the energy efficiency specialist? Um, and then, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, I, I thought that was your two questions. I'm sorry. Um, no, that, that is kind of part part one of my question of, of first okay. question, two parts. Well, since, sorry. I, since I've interrupted you, can I address those questions? Sure. Yes, the um, we believe we have a complete final final I'll say draft of an agreement regarding the uh, electric vehicle sort of data monitoring prod pilot, I'll call it. And um, we'll be bringing that to the PUC, hopefully at the next meeting, certainly the one after that, if not at the next one. And the um, just today, we, I believe, we wrapped finished up, interviews. we finished interviews for um, the energy for the energy conservation and efficiency specialist and I believe we have identified a preferred candidate as a result of all the interviews. And Ms. since it resides totally in the electric division, Mr. Bukeri will uh, be handling the administrative process with human resources going forward to uh, to formalize this and and uh, hopefully bring bring somebody in. That sounds good. Thank you very much. Um, the other question would would be in regard to um, the workshop coming up or generally in-person meetings. Yep. Um, I was under the impression from our from, from the meeting on November 17th uh, when I had asked if from in-person meetings audio recordings could be made available on the website on, on the town government channel website or the YouTube channel. And now today I receive an email that if I wanted to listen to the recording, I would need to come uh, to the office and bring um, a new flash drive. So I, I wanted to ask one more time, would it be possible to make the audio recording available on the website instead of me bringing a flash drive to the office? Yeah, Ms. Kopfer, my secretary, this is Rick Hendershot, and I yes. worked on that response, and it's identical response that we provided a few months ago, and right. it's it's the only way we know how to do it. But I was under the impression that in November we had talked about, and none of the PUC members had um, any, any um, concerns with it, that you would explore if um, Scott Henley or whoever his successor is um, could instead post the audio recording on the website or a link on the website to the audio recording so the public can access that. Uh, I'm not muted, am I? No, no, okay. Um, that, I recall the discussion and we'd have to explore that with town with government TV, uh, as I sit here now, I do not know the answer. What what is and isn't capable? I do not believe that Mr. Hanley has his replacement has been identified. So I don't know that there's anyone in that role, and um, that that's an avenue of which I do not know, and we would have to further explore it. Yes, can you please do that? <laughs> I mean, I had asked that that discussion was back in November. It's February now, and I would really appreciate if you can find out how that can be done. We will try. Thank you very much. Okay, are there any that other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, you ma'am. Uh, any other questions from the public? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? 
Hello? Yes, hello. Hi. Go ahead. Is that Steve? You got to identify yourself. Oh, he dropped off. Uh, well, he dropped off on one. He he was on the, he was on the phone on that one, and he's on his computer on a, on another one. Uh, Tony. Yeah. Steve, you still with us? Yeah, Steve. We Steve, we cannot hear you. He might be dialing back in. I I don't know. Uh, he could be dialing back in. Yeah, this is true. Although I'm surprised he's not on it with his, you know, on the on his computer. But uh, who knows? I realize that doesn't always work for everybody. Tell you what, we'll do. Why don't we move on? If he if he comes back on and he and he has questions, which he apparently did, uh, we'll take him up when he comes back on. Uh, with that in mind, why don't we move on to item number five, which is a discussion and action resolution with regard to the retirement of William Walsh. Is there a motion to approve the re the resolution included here in? Uh, so moved, Mr. Chairman. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, any comments uh, you'd like to make, Neil, uh, with regard to Mr. Walsh? Uh, certainly. Uh, so Bill Walsh uh, retired. Um, from the Wallingford Sewer Division on uh, Friday, February 5, uh, 2021. Um, I think the resolution uh, certainly captured him very well. Uh, he was always known for his quick wit. Um, I appreciated his dry sarcasm myself personally. Uh, and he always seemed to have a uh, plethora of knowledge and a little trivial fact uh, to always entertain you with. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, we do wish Bill uh, all the best in his retirement and his next ventures. Neil, thank you. Uh, if there are no other comments with regard to that, I'll ask, I'll call for a vote on it. All those in favor of approving the resolution signify by saying aye. 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 I will assume that we have a have that unanimously. Next order of business is then moving on to uh, item number six, which is the water pollution control facility update. Uh, Neil, I know you provided that to us uh, via the internet earlier today. Uh, if you care to go through that and update it, uh, certainly uh, for uh, the people out there and for the recording, I can walk through what was included uh, with the project update provided this afternoon to the Public Utilities Commission. So even though uh, we have had some inclement weather, I think you'll notice quite a lot is still going on at the construction site. Uh, so we'll begin at the secondary settling tanks. Um, the contractor continues to proceed uh, with the excavation and sheeting installation for the two additional secondary Settling tanks. I do thank each of you uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to see that. Um, so uh, we do have a design moving forward, and so we just did reinitiate that excavation and sheeting within the last couple days. Moving over to the secondary pump station, the contractor has formed and installed the uh, reinforcing seal for the grade level deck. Uh, so the next step will be to pour the concrete for the floor uh, that could begin tomorrow, as early as tomorrow, but we are looking uh, forward or looking ahead to the weather on Thursday as well uh, to look at our schedule. And three of the 15 columns between the grade level deck and the roof have been formed and poured. So those are the east columns closest to the administration building. Moving over to the Tertiary Phosphorus Building, quite a few activities have taken place in the last 30 days. Uh, the contractor has completed rubbing or finishing uh, the interior concrete. Installation of the 36-inch influent pipe and the 30-inch bypass pipe are complete. And installation of the 42-inch effluent pipe is ongoing. Construction of the parapet wall is complete. Slide gates and stock log, stop log frames at the influent box have been installed. Slide gates 
for the Aptiflow treatment trains are in process of being installed. And just as a reminder, we do have two treatment trains in parallel. So all the slide gates are essentially doubled. Approximately one half of the floor fill on the lower level has been poured. And you might ask what we mean by that statement. So when they do the initial pour of the concrete, we basically bring it up to a rough grade. So the floor fill brings it up to finish grade, approximately those last three inches or so. Um, and then a tent, and we kind of put that in quotes there, has been installed along the south and east walls of the Tertiary Phosphorus Building with installation along the north and the west walls ongoing. Uh, this will allow the masonry subcontractor to heat the space uh, for installation of the exterior brick walls as well as the brickwork on the exterior of the building. And the masons have begun installation of the concrete masonry units on the south and east walls. Uh, moving over to the UV in the post-duration building, uh, the UV equipment has been installed in the motor control center uh, for the UV and post-duration operations have also been placed. And right now the electricians are working on installing uh, the conduits and wiring. So the actual equipment is in place, uh, has not been uh, energized yet. Um, so the emergency generator building, uh, the brickwork is complete and the brick has also been washed, which is essentially cleaning up the stray bits of mortar that get stuck on the exterior of the brick. Uh, the personnel building, so the temporary standby generators have been connected and the existing or now the prime excuse me the prior standby generator has been removed it is being temporarily stored at the electric yard uh, tony and i are going to meet for a more permanent holding space for that and within the personnel building uh, the interior wall um, adjacent to the standby generator has been removed as we make room for the new electrical panels uh, taking a look at the financials it remains the same as it was last month. Uh, so the contract sum to date is $45,612,869.36. And the contract completion date uh, remains essentially 359 days from today, February 10, 2022. So with that, uh, I'll answer any questions the commission may have. Yes, Joe. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Neil, you've done a remarkable job uh, managing this. And, and um, you know, as we review this site, it's it's you know very very complicated site. Uh, so, uh, my question is: Are you encountering or, or are you finding any conflicts with the ongoing operation of the treatment works with the construction? And it, it's, again, it's remarkable that we're keeping the plant operational at the same time. We've got a major construction uh, site, on, construction ongoing. Are you encountering any conflicts that need to be resolved? So from an operational perspective, uh, we, you know, so we have two types of meetings. Um, we have, um, we actually have three meetings. So we have a monthly progress meeting with DEEP. We go over more administrative items with that. Um, myself, the project manager from C.H. Uh, Nickerson and the project manager from AECOM meet once a month uh, to go over more granular administrative items, potential change orders, change orders, schedule like that. And then on a weekly basis, uh, we have the superintendent for C.H. Nickerson meeting with Dan Sullivan, the superintendent of the sewer division to look at uh, operational items. So from an operational perspective, uh, we've been able to work through any of the challenges. And one of the things that comes up to place, comes up to speed is, you know, we had to move one of the uh, 5,000 gallon alum tanks in order to make accommodations. So we worked through that. Um, you know, we're now filling the alum tank from John Street because they can't get down to where they go. So operationally, we've worked through it. I think uh, second part of that answer is uh, we certainly have run into um, some existing structures that we did not know were at the site, specifically in the location of the secondary settling tanks 
number five and six. So um, we have hit a portion of an old uh, basin. We have hit, we have uh, completely excavated and removed an old pump station. And as you saw a little, um, about two and a half weeks ago, you know, we did run into a conflict uh, with the existing UV tank. So, um, you know, we're basically on version 3.0 of the wastewater treatment plant site and things, you know, get left in place and now we have to dig them up <laughs> and remove them. So that's going to kind of do like a 360 around the site really quick. Um, at this point, you know, we are we are out of the ground, as they say. So we've always said that there's really two big categories um, for potential change orders or change orders, and one is buried conflicts, you know, and I think we've worked our way through that. Um, and the other right now is electrical. So we're waiting to see where electrical goes. I think, you know, you know, one of the uh, change orders, we did have to pick up temporary power for the rotating biological contactors. And so that really was a phasing issue as well. You know, we just, we have a very aggressive schedule. So I think in high level, those are the things that, that come to mind right now. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, uh, this is through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one, Neil, thanks very much for the timely disclosure of these issues last month and the opportunity for you to take time out of your busy schedule to permit members of the commission to come down and actually inspect and look at what the issues were. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the ability, one, of you taking time to tell us and also making time out of your busy schedule to permit us to, to understand what the issues are as they develop. And I, I just think that's so important as we move down this process of, of trying to get this thing completed by next February 10th. And then the other question, as you were develop, as you were developing your, your your answer for Joel, you talked about the number of meetings that you have per month. What percentage of your month is spent on this project? I so let's let's maybe break it down to forty hours a week. I definitely would say I'm at least at least eight hours a week. It's probably a good hour to a day. Just okay. communication, it's communication, coordination, it's emails, it's, you know, easily 90 minutes a day without even, and that's, and that's probably minimum. Okay. And uh, do you, I haven't looked at the, the budget numbers yet. I mean, uh, do you need any support based on the amount of additional support and based on the allocation of your finite time that you you have at the at the facility? No, because we have. I mean, AECOM has really been a great partner, and so I think you know we 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 utilize them for the facility plan and for the design, and now for construction administration. It's it's still the same personnel, so I think you know we started this in 2017 you know it's been three and a half years we've all been together we you know myself and the aecom project manager know each other well we know what our touch points are you know i mean and you just make time you know i mean i think there's this is a big project it's a big expensive project for the ratepayers so we just make time and you know i mean aecom knows that what they put in front of myself and Dan Sullivan, we expect them to kind of have run the pros and the cons before they get to us. You know, we're, we're, we get into the weeds, we get granular, but at the same time, you know, there's a, there's a whole team with AECOM behind us. And that's what we're paying for. Okay, thank you, nothing further. Okay. Neil, thank you very much. Uh, I can certainly echo Patrick and Joel's, uh, if you will, sort of pat on the back for all you're doing in, term, in terms of keeping us informed as thoroughly as you do in a, the timely manner in which you do it. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, it, you know, I agree. It's a, you know, when, when you take a look at that project site, trying to go ahead and with an 
and fit 10 pounds operas into a five pound bag almost, uh, which is what we're almost doing, uh, you know, with, with the new with the new components that we're putting in there. You know, I, all I can say is I commend you, AECOM and Nickerson and Dan Sullivan you know, and, and crew for being able to work through it and keep us on track. So thank you very much. We do appreciate it. Uh, Steve, I believe that may be you uh, as caller number three, you're not identified. Uh, did you have questions that you wanted to go ahead and ask of us? Yeah, can you hear me? I, I can hear you, yes. Okay. Um, my first question was, they're having some big power issues down in Texas in that area. And mm -hmm. I guess the price has spiked to like 9,000 kilowatt hour, megawatt hour. Can that happen around here? Or how are we protected from it happening? Steve, this is Rick. Um, I, guess, I guess in theory it could, but it's very unlikely. Um, I've, I've done some, uh, some reading on what's going on in Texas, and it seems to be, uh, quote an old uh, series of children's books, a series of unfortunate events. Yeah. Um, Incredible record-breaking cold for Texas. Uh, temperatures and therefore winter electric loads for which they do not plan. Um, the physical realities of the natural gas transmission system and heavy distribution system down there, it sounds like it's not performing well. That the the equipment for moving the gas through the pipelines was not intended to operate in temperatures such as this and somewhat exacerbating the problem i don't think as much has been as much as the noise about it has been but it, it's it's part of the equation is texas has installed an awful lot of renewable energy in particular wind and very little of that is working because of ice and lack of wind and it's all come together to create, pardon my very unfunny pun, to make a perfect storm for the poor people of Texas. Um, but the, the largest problem seems to be the lack of the ability to get sufficient natural gas to the, to the gas-fired power plants inside Texas. And one other thing I'll note, the Texas wholesale grid is only the state of Texas. It's an organization called ERCOT, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. As such, they stand outside of federal jurisdiction because they aren't subject to the Federal Power Act because there's no interstate commerce going on. That's my understanding. That's, that's a very Texas attitude, and it's not by accident that they're structured that way. But as a result, they aren't subject to all the same reliability standards that the rest of the country is. And that reality may be visiting itself upon the electric grid of Texas this week. All right, thank you. I have one more question. Okay, Steve, if I may follow up on something that Rick said here. Um, yep. Keep one thing in mind too, that Wallingford, has has we have an advantage in many respects in as you know if something happened to the grid because of the agreement that we have with Wallingford Energy, we the first two at least two of the units would be able to be used to go ahead and keep us in power, assuming that they had that there's natural gas available in the pipelines. So that yes, it would require a lot of internal switching within our system, but we could pretty much keep a good portion of our system going. Uh, as I say, we have an advantage on that. In part, this the units that more of energy has would be used, if you will, if the grid went down entirely, they would be used to help to restart the grid overall. So as I say, we can operate, if you will, so to speak, in island mode here, and which would be an advantage that we have, but that's in part, large part due to the agreement that we have with Wallingford Energy, uh, which has been perpetuated since the initial PPNL agreement. So that's, as I say, that's something that we have that we're fortunate to have that agreement in place. Your next question is what, sir? Um, 
I think I've asked this before, but I don't remember the answer. Why doesn't Wallingford own all the poles? Why does Frontier own any? Would I, I didn't catch all of that? I don't know if Rick did, I, I, but I got it, Bob. His his question was, why don't we own all okay. of the poles within town? Why does Frontier own some of them? Uh, it's okay. really a matter of as the town built out, who got there first to install the poles? Oops. And um, it's joint. Technically, it's any anywhere we're both on the poles. It's technically joint ownership. But, but there is a concept called jurisdiction, and then that that identifies the person, the the entity that is responsible for the pole. It's maintenance, upkeep, and replacement. And the 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 firm with jurisdiction is the firm to whom the third party attachers pay for that attachment. Correct. So, so, so can anybody come in and attach to the poles? No. Pretty much yes, well, as long as they fuck. Yeah, they, they've yeah. got to have a they, they've got to execute agreement with the jurisdictional entities, Perfect. and they and they yeah and they have to have the proper permits in place uh with pura to be operating an overhead i'll say communications system what because that's who it is it's always communications utilities that, that wish to attach but with that if there's space on the pole they may attach and then you know once the attachment agreement is executed and then the 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 pole owner i'll use that term uh collects those rents and um oh, there's another point i yes, wanted to I mean, make through those through those through those attachment agreements there's there's a, an application process so anytime anybody wants to attach to a pole once an agreement's in place they have to send in an application and it needs to be engineered we determine whether or not there's space in the pole if there is it's a go ahead if not we determine who who's responsible for replacing the pole and creating the height and oftentimes it's the attacher that would be responsible for doing that uh, unless the pole is completely aged out and due for replacement anyways thank you you're welcome that was, that was it okay Steve, I thank you and I'm, I'm glad you're able to get back in back on so that you could ask your questions all right uh, thank, thank, thank you for taking my questions well you it took you a few minutes to get back in but so I but I wanted to make sure that you had the opportunity um I appreciate it right. thank you well you're entirely welcome uh okay is there any other business to be brought before us Rick do you have any uh, correspondence or anything of that elk no, but I want to take this time and this opportunity to thank both general managers and in particular Brian Naples, who's here in the conference room with Tony and I, but you can't see him, um, for their efforts these past couple of weeks to complete and produce the draft budgets for fiscal 21 slash 22 that we'll be discussing uh, Thursday afternoon. Hey, Brian in particular, he has literally been two places at one time most of the past week or so. And, you know, doing the work of Tom Sullivan and Bill Phelan. B Bill's come in a little bit to help out, but this, the, the products you gentlemen have received just today um, is largely Brian's handiwork. And uh, I, I, I didn't want the opportunity to go by without thanking him in front of you gentlemen for his hard work and uh, extremely good attitude in the face <laughs> of, um, you know, the tremendous, you know, it, it's been a big ask by Tony Neal and I on for Brian and he's, he's risen to the occasion. Uh, based on what I, Based on what I have seen of Brian, he is quietly effective, <laughs> and, and that's you know, he, you know I've seen him in a number of meetings, pri primarily with regard to the ERMOC, et cetera. But I mean, uh, 
He I'm is. Glad he was, he was, I'm, uh, I'm glad he can wear both hats at this point to go ahead and keep us help help to keep us straight. And from the perspective of the commission, I'll say, Brian, thank you. In addition to thanking the two general managers and and yourself, Rick, for all the time, the effort that goes into preparing the various budgets. Okay. Any other uh, comments, gentlemen? Yes, Patrick. Two things. First, um, I thought actually, Mr. Chairman, you were going to say that Brian was quietly taking over the financial infrastructure of the utilities. I was going to sort of kid laugh at that, but just uh, two points. Number one, uh, Mr. Hendershot, thank you for the the, the response, uh, the informative response that you had to Mr. Gale's question. There's actually an article on the front page of the New York Times about the Texas grid, and I'm going to I'm going to read that based on some of your your insight and i suspect i'm going to be much much more well informed to read that article uh based on your answer and the other uh comment that i wanted to make to mr gale's second question i wanted to thank mr reinbold because the issue of attachments and the con our contracts on attachments he actually raised some very significant um insightful questions the last time we had an attachment agreement come before the puc and it's it just goes to to show the the level of expertise that that he brings to the commission and and I'm truly appreciative of it. Thank you, Patrick. Easy peasy. <laughs> okay. All right. If there is nothing else to be brought before us, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second for that? Second. Okay. All those in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. Bye. Aye. We stand adjourned at 1912. Gentlemen and Bernadette, we will see all of you then on uh, Thursday at uh, 5 o'clock in room 315. Okay? Okay. Yes. See you then. Thank you. Have a good evening. Gentlemen. You too.